Okay, in the previous video, the one that's marked part one, and this one, we're going to continue. I ended up hitting the red button. That's a no-no if you want to continue a video after putting it on pause. You have to hit the pause button, so that was a mistake. I do apologize. We were talking about capacities, and thus the focal point of this video and for the SACPAC members for whom it's the design. Uh, whom it is designed. It was, what was it, 8.59 this morning is when we started that video and I put you all on hold. So 9 o'clock in the a.m. It is now 1.24, or excuse me, 1.18, sorry, looking at the 4 and thinking 20 and then adding 4. Uh, because it has been several hours, I made notes just before putting you on pause to make sure I would continue where we left off. Individuals need to understand that it is all about capacities and you have to establish your capacity, whether you're in court, a different capacity, whether you're dealing with a police officer, a different capacity, whether you're dealing with your children, a different capacity. See, remember, when you are at work, you're not a mother or a father or a dad, you're an employee, or you are a supervisor, or you are an owner. That's your capacity, and that's the capacity for which you operate, or the lane in which you are driving and traveling on. Many of you assume that you can operate more than one capacity at one time. If you go back to the matrix, please understand that that was the theme of the matrix, pay attention. Each person had a role to play or a capacity for which they operated. Neil, however, was different. And out of all of the other people there, there was only one other one than he, and that person didn't realize his potential until, as he said, Neil had brought it to his attention. However, remember, out of all the Millions of people associated with the Matrix film, only two people were allowed to operate in more than one capacity. What does this mean? It means the rest of you are like the rest of the people in the Matrix. You are not Neil. You are not Mr. Agent Smith. You cannot operate two capacities. Now go back and look. Did Agent Smith operate in two capacities? No. Because once he realized that he could operate in more than one capacity. What did he do? Did he not disconnect and choose to operate only in one capacity? Go back and watch how he takes the earpiece, Matrix Revolution, out of his ear, drops it to the ground because he disconnected or he stopped operating in a particular capacity. Okay, he literally disaffirmed that agreement, that contract, and refused to participate. Now, there were consequences for his actions. So just as all of you will do an action, there are consequences for your actions. So you have to, from the very beginning, think of all the things that possibly could happen as a result of your decision. So back to capacities. Let me see if I can better illustrate and demonstrate how everything is about capacities. Many of you have known about SEDM.org, SEDM.org. This is results from the straw man. What I decided was to put in the straw man here because everywhere you go, and a straw man is a capacity, but everywhere you go on the internet, they talk about the straw man being illegal, that it is just some rhetoric, that it is just some fantasical position of people. Oh, restrictions says you have to be logged in. I don't want to be logged in, S-E-D-M. Okay, I don't know why I should have to be logged into your website to review something so simple as a simple article. No, see, I'm not saying anything negative about the organization here. What I am telling you so that you all understand is on our site, that's the first thing everybody asks. Do, do, do we have to uh, sign up? for? No, you do not. Everything on our site, all access to all of our documents are free. 
You don't pay anything for it. We put that up there for free. And yes, many people, many people, not just a few, but many people have taken the information from there and have started their own websites, have started their own companies. And we don't have a problem with that, ladies and gentlemen. We encourage that. We tell you that the information doesn't belong to us. Information, no one has the authority to patent information. You hear about information technology. Ladies and gentlemen, if you only understood how information comes about, how nobody is the inventor of an idea, no one was the first to have an idea except for the first person who had that idea. And if you think that is you, then you have to go back to the age-old adage, there's nothing new under the sun. So we're going to continue. Uh, the reason why we went to SEDM is because this document right here is from there. Proof that there is a straw man. Now, I like this because I don't need proof. But these individuals went and put together an article to prove that there is a straw man. Now, what do they talk about? They talk about the different capacities. Now, I didn't know that this, I didn't look for this document prior to now. I wanted to be prepared for when I turned the video back on that we could discuss some of this. So by turning it back on, let me explain it so that you get it. Oh, and by the way, I do know that Mr. Um, Thomas Clark Nelson had to have been associated with this somehow because I noticed that he refers to franchise. The taxpayer is a franchise. FDIC is an insurance franchise. The social security number is a franchise, insurance franchise. This is definitely Thomas Clark Nelson because this is how he did his document that he put together. Well, all of his documents. So I'm pretty certain that he was associated. Now that individual I'm told has passed away. I don't have confirmation of that because I really didn't know much about Th Thomas Clark Nelson. I just know that I've read his documents and have a great deal of respect for him and explaining to people exactly what the law is and what the law is not. And that's the point. You can find his documents at, I believe it is archive.org. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's do that real quick because we took you here and we can't get the document here. But the document that I have there, we're going to, uh, let's see, T. Uh, we're going to do Word. Well, we're just going to put Docs. So Thomas Clark Nelson Docs. You're going to see archive.org will be one of the first sites that comes up. There you go. Okay. Purging America from the Matrix, 2013. Ladies and gentlemen, I am strongly, strongly going to suggest that you download Thomas Clark Nelson's documents. As a matter of fact, I think we will take it and put it on our site because he backs up everything with case law. I went ahead and looked at the case law that he backed up and I randomly chose it to just to make sure. That's how you can confirm whether or not a person knows what they know. When they give you evidence or proof, you can randomly select that evidence to find what you need. And I was able to do that with Thomas Clark Nelson. These are the documents here. So, as a matter of fact, there are at least two more documents here that weren't here before. There are at least three documents that are here now that weren't here before. And I need to figure out how to download. Let's see. I have a software that will let me download, but it ain't going to let me download now. So let's see if I can do it this way. Copy. And we're going to put you all on pause for a second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, what I have done is I've spent the last roughly an hour because it's now 2.06 and it was 1.18 when we put you all on pause. But I spent the last hour finding the documents, and we're going to be placing them on our site. I would strongly suggest you not take my word for it or Thomas Clark's word. Now, I said that Thomas Clark passed away. At least that's what I was told. 
And we know how information like that gets taken out of context and out of hand. So I am not sure if Thomas Clark Nelson is still alive or if he has passed. I just know that I have a lot of respect for the young man because he has put together these documents and put together it in such a format that when you go over the document, you can be proved by the evidence that he presents. He doesn't just put words together. He gives you the opportunity to research it for yourself and to come to the knowledge on your own, which is a whole lot more valuable than if I gave you the knowledge and then walked away saying, yep, did my job, I can move on. Because when it all boils down to it, you will have to stand on your quote unquote own square. Many of you, I'm sorry, are not able to stand on your own square. So that's what we are trying to do. Now, when he speaks about an affidavit, this is, I want you to make sure that you all understand something. An affidavit is not what they say an affidavit is. An affidavit is what an affidavit is. It's a statement of truth. You don't have to call it a statement of truth. It is just true. Now, let's continue with capacity because that's where this got started. Thomas Clark Nelson helps you to understand the different capacities that are created by government. He talks about the corporate franchise. Now, you'll find that in why the 14th Amendment is a political Trojan horse. Okay? By all means, they want... He's suggesting that you read them in order. I'm going to suggest the exact same thing. Because that's what I did, and I came to find out that I could rely on the information being presented. So... What I've done is, I remember I said this. there's at least three more documents here that weren't here the last time. Well, this one is duplicated, so that's one. Then we have Purge in America, that's two. And then the third one is the uh, tax collector. That was all on one form, the response to tax collecting. Now, many of you guys are telling me that you're getting notices from the IRS. Look, as I told you, I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I do believe firmly in what Jesus said, that individuals must pay back Caesar's things to Caesar. However, in the United States, Caesar is not the IRS. It is not the U.S. Treasury. It is not the president of the United States. It is the people of the United States. Now, if you don't believe me about Caesar being the people of the United States, let's see if I can give you this information from Congress. Democracy and its American interpretation. What is the purpose of the U.S. government? The purpose is to express, is expressed in the preamble of the Constitution. Now, we can't go by that because we've already learned that this is not the preamble. What form of government do we have in the United States? The United States, under its Constitution, is a federal representative democratic republic. Democratic republic. It is not a democratic republic. It is a republic. Democratic republic. Yeah, whatever. An indivisible union of 50 sovereign states, which has the exception of town meetings, a form of pure democracy, we have at the local and state and national levels of government. Ladies and gentlemen, the people's choice is on the state level. The people get to vote. I don't vote. I never will vote. I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Jesus says that his followers are no part of the world. I purport to be one of his followers, so I choose not to vote. This is not about religion. By mentioning the word Bible, or by mentioning the name Jesus, doesn't make this a religious conversation. I'm only stating to everyone that I advocate supporting government whenever we humanly can possibly support government. However, Government has limits as to what type of support they can ask for. So they have asked for assistance in paying their bills. Well, I provide them that assistance. They get to utilize my credit, have access to my credit, and I don't bother them with having access to my credit. However, we have a right to receive recoupment from what is borrowed. We have a right to access government. So, as we mentioned, it's all about capacities. Many of us are pursuing things under the wrong capacity. 
we're coming to the government and we're not stating under what capacity we're coming under. So remember, un in the United States, the democracy is under the states. That's where individuals vote for every single representative. Every single representative except for the underlings, people don't vote for them. But for the most part, in most states, individuals vote for every single representative. That being the case, since they vote for every single representative, it's a democracy. The majority rules. However, on the federal level, that is not the case. Remember, senators are voted in not federally, but on the state level. You guys need to understand that. Federal judges are not voted into office. Federal judges are not voted into office. It's not democ democracy. Supreme Court judges are not voted into office. Not democracy. Who set the rules for the choosing of these judges? Was it not Congress? Did they not say that they were exercising that authority under the authority given to them by the people? So it is not democracy. Just because they say that they're doing it democratically, we've seen those hearings. We've seen how they treat each other in those hearings. We see how they slight things a particular way in the media to get you all to believe that this person is bad and that person is good when both of them are bad or both of them are good. They don't let the people decide. No, a few members of Congress decides. Why? Because if we, the people, were to decide, then things would not go the way they expect it to go. Okay, so let's get back to capacities, shall we? Because that is extremely important. So let's click and find out what Google has to say about capacity. The first thing I did was I put in capacity of a defendant. You mean the defendant has a capacity? You better believe he does. Whether it's civil or criminal, the defendant has a capacity. Now, this is taken from Cornell Law. This is referring to Rule 17 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. But this is a general principle of the court. So, designation of in general. So it's just a general statement. An action must be prosecuted in the name of the real party of interest. The following may sue in their own names without joining the person for whose benefit the action is bought, uh, brought. Excuse me. An executor. Now remember, an executor may use their own names when bringing a suit. So a person can come into the court as an executor, an administrator, a guardian, a bailee. What's a bailee? Well, you'll have to do the research, but bailee deals with bailments and bailment bonds and so on and so forth in part. I promise if you do your research on Bailey, you would appreciate the position. A trustee of an express trust. Now, a beneficiary cannot enter into these administrative courts. They have no jurisdiction. Only the trustee has jurisdiction in the court. That's why you see the attorneys coming in all the time. If a party with whom or in whose name a contract has been made by a, for another's benefit and a party authorized by statute. Action in the name of the United States for another use or benefit when the federal statute so provides an action for another use or benefit must be brought in the name of the United States. Joinder of real party of an, an interest. The court may not dismiss an action for failure to prosecute in the name of a real party of interest until after an objection a reasonable time has been allowed for the real party of interest to ratify, join, or be substituted into the action. After ratification, joinder, or substitution, an action proceeds as if it had been originally commenced by the real party of interest. Capacity to sue or be sued. And so on and so forth. Ladies and gentlemen, capacity, capacity, capacity is all this is about. That's what Section 17 is. It's the capacity in which one comes into the court as executor, administrator, guardian, bailey, trustee, and or party for whom a contract has been entered into. It's all about capacity. It's always been about capacity. 
your contracts, your set packs places you in the capacity of the grantor and the beneficiary over the estate, over the all caps name. Now they say that the straw man is a fallacy. Well, no, because we've created the straw man to represent the all block capitals name. We've been saying it all wrong. We'd say the all caps name, say that's an abbreviation for all block capitals. Okay? The proper way it should be said. Those of you who are getting the set packs and you're getting the Omega pack, the Omega pack comes with certain language to protect you and your interest and your estate. Remember, you are allowed to create your own trust agreements. There is no law prohibiting you from creating your own trust agreement if you are of competent age. You have to gain control of the securities held in your minor account. Can you think of a better way to gain control of the securities in your minor account other than you creating as the grantor a trust and that being the law of the trust, your requests, your words, your statements, your demands? Of course. So the best way to gain control of the securities held in your account is to go through the motions of documenting your standing. Standing has a whole lot to do with everything. And once you document your position or standing, you protect yourself, your interests, your estate. I.e., now you can go after total control. So this is what is being suggested. And it is being suggested that you fully, firmly, and wholeheartedly document everything that's going on. How do you do this? Well, you've already started the process by placing it on record. Now, you don't place the new trusts on record. They're private trusts. You have every right to introduce and enter into private trust agreements. Doesn't need to be signed by anybody else because if you look at the deed of trust, only one person signs that, and that's you. Placing an obligation on all parties. Does the bank accept it by sending you a notice of acceptance? Of course they do. By their actions. Their actions dictate the acceptance of the agreement. Those of you who have these trust agreements that you've sent to other parties and you gave them an opportunity to opt out, you are going to need to enforce those provisions. You don't have to run and force the provisions on someone. What you do is you document the record. So what is being suggested is monkey see, monkey do. So what I'm getting ready to do as an individual, not SACOM, I as an individual, am getting ready to do is the following. We're going to open this up. And the Thomas Clark Nelson documents should be on the website and made available to all who would like them under that title. We were downloading the documents here, but it appears that they did not finish. So I downloaded them separately. This is the Judicial Conference of the United States Committee on Judicial Conduct and Disability. So these are the rules. Now I want you to pay attention. These are the rules for the United States judges. Well, who are the United States judges? That's every judge in the United States who has been elected to a position or and who has been appointed to a position of judge. Now, here's the point. I want you to pay attention. Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 1980. Then they put this. You see the fact that they put the actual title of the act and then they put this? This is supposed to be their prima facie evidence of this actual statutory law. This is right here. That's why it follows. This is the prima facie evidence. Statute is prima facie, or the, the actual code is prima facie evidence of the actual so-called law being the statute. Ladies and gentlemen, 
we're going to put together a general complaint form for you. We're going to post that. Then we're going to have a video done on the Eon channel because he has a better grasp of what would be necessary than the rest of the members here at SACOM. And what will happen is we will then proceed to pay attention, please, file each one of these complaints and FOIA requests. FOIA requests will be separate, but complaints and FOIA requests simultaneously. We're not trying to disrupt anything, but we're trying to say enough. And by following everything together, that gives them the same thing that they've been doing to us for years. We have a case against a particular set of attorneys with Penny Mac. And what they have done is they've sent us reams of paper. I've done that to the court. So, of course, I learned it from attorneys. And they're doing it to us. So it is nothing illegal with it. They say that this junk is evidence and we have to rebut it. Well, ladies and gentlemen... What I am here to tell you is that we are not going to send them rims of documents. What we're going to do is we're going to send them documentation, a complaint, statements of claim, and we're going to give them a 30-day period in which to respond. We're not going to give them 15 days. We're not going to give them 14 days. We're going to give them 30 days. We're not going to give them 60 days. We're going to give them 30 days to respond. However, we're not just sending it to one agency, we're sending it to all the major players. Why? Because as Mr. Thomas Clark Nelson has, if you go and look at the documents, they're going to be on the site by the time this video is up. If you go and look at what Mr. Nelson is saying, we have to notify them of the change in terms of agreement. See, when you send government a notice and you are basically saying, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, this is the way things are going to be, you're giving them a notice of change in terms. Okay? Now, pay attention to this. Where to file a complaint? Who may be complained about? Do you believe that a federal judge committed misconduct or has a disability? You may file a complaint about it with the proper court office. Proper court office. Now, pay attention. These are catchphrases. That's word specific. What's the proper office? The complaint against a United States district judge or a United States bankruptcy judge? Well, first of all, bankruptcy judges are not judges. They're legislative. So they're not part of the judicial branch. A magistrate is not a judge. He is a magistrate. You must file it in the clerk's office of the United States Court of Appeals for the region or circuit in which the judge serves. If the complaint is against the judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, if the complaint is against a judge of the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, you must file it at the Circuit Executive Office of that court. If the complaint is against any other United States Circuit judge or against a judge of a national court, the Court of International Trade or the Court of Federal Claims, you must file it at the clerk's office of the court in which the judge serves. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you know the rule. If you want to get a response, follow the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, you know the rules. If you want to get a response, a proper response, follow the rules. Ladies and gentlemen, if you don't, follow the rules, then you cannot be disappointed if they don't follow the rules. Let's see if we can express that one more time so that people will get it. You all have not been following the rules, and yet you complain when they don't follow the rules. Now, the reason why we can say that you all have not followed the rules is because you are not attorneys. You didn't go to school to learn all of the ins and outs of the rules. Every time you get a case against you, you must petition the court to suspend the rules because you're not an attorney. And it is a dis it's an unfair disadvantage to you for subjecting you to rules for which you are not an expert and or familiar with as that of the other party in the court. That's what you should be suggesting to the court. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, We'll be putting these complaints together over the next two weeks. 
and then we will get together and we will send them out. We will put complaints against each one of the judges that you have had a dealing with who has violated a secured right. What are your secured rights? Get familiar with the Bill of Rights, the first 10 Bill of Rights of the original Bill of Rights. How do we find out what those Bill of Rights are? Some of you are unfamiliar with the following, so we will familiarize you with that at this time. We can do it here. What I'm doing is the Bill of Rights, now I needed you, and they say the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution because the Bill of Rights was not added to the Constitution. The Bill of Rights was the Constitution, and that's what people don't understand. A R C H I V E dot G O V. Archive dot gov. That's where we want. Oh, it's, yeah, it's archive. It's National Archives, but it's archive dot gov. And so we're going to click on archive dot gov when it pulls up. We want this Bill of Rights at archive dot gov. We could have just simply put in archive dot gov and gotten it, but many of you are not aware of the research. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull up the Bill of Rights transcript. Either way, you would have gotten that information. Many of you who have not seen the other research, you didn't know that the preamble, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice and ensure domestic tranquility for ourselves and our prosperity to ordain and establish uh, uh, promote the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of the liberty for ourselves and our prosperity to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, please understand that the preamble to the Constitution is not what you just heard me state verbatim. The preamble to the Constitution is not what you just heard me state. Please pay attention. The following text is a transcription of the enrolled original of the joint resolution of Congress proposing the Bill of Rights, which is a on permanent display at the Rotunda in the National Archives. Now it says the following is a transcription. We don't want the following then because it's not the actual. It's according to a resolution. So that doesn't make it official. That's a proposal. Let's take a look at this because this is not a proposal. Preamble to the Bill of Rights, begun and held in the city of New York on Wednesday, the 4th of March, 1789. Remember, the Constitution was enacted into, quote-unquote, as they call it, law, in 91. Okay, 18, or 1791. The Constitution and members of the states having blah, 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 blah. We don't need to read it. Having resolved, blah, 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 blah. The following text is a transcription of the first 10 amendments of the Constitution in their original form. These amendments were ratified December 15, 1791, and form what is known as the Bill of Rights. Okay, this is your Constitution. The first 10, there was nothing else that was there when they brought it into law. It's known as the Bill of Rights. Okay the capitalization and pronunciation or uh, punctuations of this version is from the enrolled original of the joint resolution of congress proposing the bill of rights which is on permanent display at the rotunda of the national archives building okay ladies and gentlemen the we the people of the united states we're definitely suggesting that people do their research on the information that's being here presented See, this saying this is what associ uh, was associated with the joint resolution, but the only problem is, and this is, this is the problem that we are having, the only problem is the actual Constitution, when it was enacted, there are some questions. There are some questions whether or not that was the Constitution or whether or not the Bill of Rights that we're just referring to is the actual Bill of Rights. Okay, the convention of a number of states having at the time their adoption of the Constitution expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruing or construction and abuse of its power 
that further declaration of respective clauses or restrictive clauses should be added. And as extending the grounds of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent, 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 excuse me, ends of its institution. Might never have been ratified if the farmer, 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 farmers hadn't promised to add the Bill of Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, they could not have gotten the Constitution together without the Bill of Rights because the Bill of Rights is the Constitution. Go back and look. There were only 10. There weren't 15, 20, or 30 in 1791. In 1789, there was only one Bill of Rights, but originally there were 12. And they ratified it and put this together, known as the Ten Amendments. Like I said, the Bible had Ten Commandments, and they wanted to mimic that by creating Ten Amendments. All right. Now, again, we have this document with proof that there is no straw man that we just placed on the site, and we're going to let you all have access to this. Let's see if we can uh, pull it up so that I can download it again and put it in that folder so that when you guys do download it, now you'll even get that record from Congress. That will even be in the folder. Okay, so you will have access to that. All you have to do, the folder that it is in, is Thomas Clark Nelson. That is the name of the folder. Might as well give Thomas Clark his credit. And so thus, we named the folder after Thomas Clark Nelson. If you get a chance to read the documents by Thomas Clark Nelson, and it is one of those study reads, because Thomas Clark Nelson is showing you the foundation of the codes, the foundation of the laws. Not everyone, but the major ones. He's showing you the Supreme Court case decisions and how it relates to those codes, those laws. So we'll put those documents together. You will have them and you will be able to go from there. My problem is I don't know what page this is on and I have to download it. So let's see if we can save it and if it'll save as PDF. If not, after I do the video, I will save this file. Remember, this is in a two part video part one part two and so i will put it together we're going to get rid of the google books part and because it is google books oh yes it's doing html and i don't want to do html but i will save it nonetheless for those of you who don't have the link but Oh, okay, I do also understand the reason why it hasn't, because when I chose it, I chose it this way, proof of the straw man. So I chose it this way because it is Google Books. And so they have at a S-E-D-M, okay, they have it there. It's form number 05.042. I hope that that's explanational. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time. As we said, we're working very hard to make sure that the, here it is right here. So we will have the PDF. And like I said, I appreciate S-E-D-M. And the unique thing is that I, I definitely need to express this so that you guys understand. I used to know what S-E-D-M stood for. I know the last word stands for ministry. Okay. I am sorry that I couldn't hold on to it because it wasn't something that I would say all the time. So I don't hold on to such information. But I will say for a certainty that I have a lot of appreciation for S-E-D-M and the information that they give. I do know that I've done the research on the taxes and they have information on their site with those of you who are having tax difficulties and communicating with the IRS because yes, sometimes, and I'm sorry, the IRS by not answering the phones or by not providing detailed responses to people's inquiries might be a little difficult to deal with. And so what I am suggesting is that you take a visit to 
S-E-D-M dot org. And you might find something very helpful on the site. As the members there says, the information is free. The only thing you have to do is register. Ladies and gentlemen, we will have the document that we just showed you. It will be up on the site as well. I want to thank you for your taking the time to gain a better understanding of your capacity and how you are to engage in securing the securities held in your minor account. Here's the problem. Because you are the grantor, we cannot secure the securities held in your account but we can help you secure those securities. You'll be hearing from us over the next couple of weeks and next couple of months explaining this information. We want to thank you for taking the time once again, and we ask that all of you please have a very good day. Goodbye, your friends here at SACOM.